So um, I'm going to talk about big data meeting financial services, and here's the punchline for the talk. Um, to get value out of big data, what you actually need to do, a bit paradoxically, is make it small. And a really good strategy for doing that is to make it visual. So here's how we're going to get through this. Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of the relationship between value, insight, and action. And uh, um, we've, we at, in, at Imperial have independently hit on this thing of insight as being really important even before we knew that KPMG would be building these insight centers around the world. But it is nice how that comes together. Um, we'll be talking about some of the things that are going on in financial services. Uh, talk about what is big data just to get a grounding. Then we'll go into what do we mean by making it small, a few illustrations of situations where we've tried to make big data small, um, some questions to ponder, and then a metaphor uh, about insight and action to end on. So here's really the logic of everything that I'm going to be talking about. Um, the value of data, of big data, any kind of data, is a function of its ability to help you take some kind of action. So if you're thinking about value creation and you're investing a whole bunch of stuff in big data and you're not getting to the place where you're able to make different decisions that get you into action that you wouldn't have been in before, then you're not yet to the point where you're getting a return on whatever you're investing in to be able to do data and analytics. So the key measure for all of this is, you know, can you act? And for that, it's going to really happen more powerfully when you can have some sort of insight out of data and analytics then if you're not getting insights. So again, you're investing, investing, investing. Be looking for things that are surprising, that are helping you say, oh, OK, this is the way the world is. I'm ready to accept that and act accordingly. And how do you get those insights? Well, it is a function of having decent data, having some analytics that boil it down, um, and some visualization, again, that boil it down. And that, that process eventually is taking big data and making it small. So the size of data sets growing rapidly, the infrastructure for, for managing data of multiple different kinds changing radically quickly, our brains not changing radically, not quickly. You know, so this, the pace of, the e of evolution that changes how our minds work is nothing like the pace of evolution that's changing how systems work and bring us data. So ultimately, we're still in the business of taking data, turning it into something that human beings can consume, interact with individually or in groups, and make decisions. And that's really what I'm going to talk about. Um, so there. You can almost fall asleep, and you've got the main point for the rest of the talk. But now, now let me do, do some sort of unfolding it. Um, to, to sort of ground this, let me say, here are two recent stories that are shaping all of the comments that I'm going to make. One is, uh, uh, about two years ago, I did a media analysis of changing mindsets toward banks uh, for a particular very, very large bank. Um, and what I was, I had about 200,000 news stories about trust issues over 15 years. And I don't mean like the uh, financial trust, but like, do I trust you as a bank? Um, and we, we had from the bank's strategic planning group some initial questions. We explored behavioral aspects of financial stress that sort of related to uh, situations where people would find trust to be important and did, it, did they really find it there. And in terms of findings, we saw a cyclical pattern of consumer uh, concerns regarding finances that we did not expect at all. Uh, so it was, it was quite a surprise. Um, second story that's kind of grounding my comments and orienting how I'm thinking about this is recently I've begun doing quite a lot of teaching with executives around how to spot kind of patterns in data. In particular, one of the things that we've been you know, really having fun with is looking at patterns in Bitcoin trades. So we have a real-time feed of all the blockchain trades in Bitcoin. And uh, we have 10-minute snapshots that are sort of graph uh, pictures of who's buying and who's selling to back and forth. Um, and non-experts like me, because I'm, I'm not a Bitcoin expert, although I'm, I'm getting there pretty quickly, uh, are able to learn to see patterns in these things very quickly. And so findings there, audiences are, are learning to see money laundering and, and different kinds of evolving attacks on the network quite quickly in the matter of five, 10 minutes, uh, which is incredible if you consider the alternative without the visualization is that you would be learning programming languages and data feeds and all kinds of IT. Um, and, and even then, how do you convey what you know to anybody else that hasn't learned what you've just learned? Um, here is uh, one of my colleagues, David Birch. He's the 
the designer of the space that you're looking at behind him there and the builder of it. This is uh, the KPMG Data Observatory, a facility for doing fantastic visualizations of, of complex data. Um, and these are snapshots of Bitcoin trades that, that, that we're looking at there. Um, you can see what we call a tapeworm structure. Um, and basically that's a series of computers that are trading rapidly Bitcoins with each other under program control to essentially suck up the network time and attack it. Um, this is part of an ongoing battle about whether the size of the blocks in, in the blockchain should be expanded. And the more that you can make it so that people can't actually do the transactions they want, then the more you might say, well, we should make the, uh, the network, uh, make the blocks bigger. So strangely, the people who are attacking the network these days are the very people who want to use it, but they want it to look different in the future. Um, and so basically you have two different groups of people that are, in addition to using Bitcoin for, you know, using blockchain to do their Bitcoin trades, they're attacking each other in hopes of sort of shifting the weight of opinion about how this thing should change. Um, this is, this picture here is worth looking at. I'll stand over here on this side. This is actually the live feed of uh, transactions coming in. After this has been happening for a while, we build up these denser pictures. This takes 15 or 20 minutes, but this is what it looks like when it's just starting. And so we're not looking at the animation here, but this is the beginning of probably that's going to be uh, a structure that turns into what we call a coin tumbling service or money laundering. And this is where we're just passing coins around from a, a group of people to, to ensure that it kind of comes back to us with no trace. Um, and here you can see that tapeworm structure that we saw in the previous slide. Um, this is the skinny one alongside a morphed version of that particular kind of attack, which is now fat. Um, more computers are involved, so it actually takes up uh, more bandwidth without having to go through so many trades. Um, so these are things that we're seeing and, and learning to see. Um, here's a completely different view from that uh, study that I mentioned. Um, we have the S&P 500 um, with this jagged line here. And then what we have here is the pattern of uh, themes in how people think about trust issues with their bank and how they think about financial health. And you can see there's kind of a strange lining up of the changes in what people are paying attention to, what they're thinking about, and what's happening with the S&P 500. And I can't say econometrically how tight that is. Um, and if, if, if I did, then uh, one of my colleagues who um, actually likes to trade on these kinds of things would shoot me. So I, I'll just keep moving. Um, so all right, fine. There's lots that's happening um, out there with big data in financial services. Uh, you, like me, have some different exposures to it. I've just given you a couple of the things that I've been looking at recently that are inspiring me to kind of think about all this stuff. But let's back up for a minute. What is big data really? Let's just get some grounding. There's a lot of confusion about this, quite a bit of fear even. Uh, so what is it? Uh, well, you hear this often, volume, velocity, variety. So volume, bigger and bigger, you know, pools of data. Uh, velocity, more and more real time, as opposed to let's look at customer data, for example. This would be the classic application from the 90s in data warehousing and data mining. And maybe we'll see uh, not just weekly, but daily. What did every one of our stores do last week? Well, you know, now it's what's happening this minute um, around the world. So increasingly real time. Those two things are not so hard as this last one, though, around variety. People are increasingly building models that take not just, for example, transaction data, uh, but what people are saying in an unstructured way, uh, what video they're watching, and the content of even what's in video. Um, so we're, we're seeing things like going from text to data structures, uh, like the, the one that I showed that allowed us to see the cyclicality. We're seeing that alongside what people are doing with transaction data. We're also seeing social network data that are, that are bringing, being brought into all kinds of analyses. So multiple kinds of data all being brought together, changing how the analytics work. Um, so this still leaves a lot of questions, though. And in fact, inside organizations, what this sort of big data conversation looks like is something maybe like this. You probably have heard stuff like this. Big data, isn't that just cloud computing? Um, or, I think it's 
really about digital marketing. Or no, 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 it's, it's not digital marketing, it's like digital strategy. Oh, and there's, there's a difference between those two? I'm not really so sure. Um, no, I think it's something to do with analytics. It's, no, it's fancy statistics. No, it's optimization. Click. <laughs> it's machine learning. So people will, will say these things. Unstructured data, I just talked about that. Is it I just IT speak for give me money so I can play and build big stuff? Um, and of course, it's all of these kinds of applications as well. Uh, this morning, we talked about workforce. Regardless of what people think it is, and there's lots of different takes on it, another thing that we have to acknowledge is that people are, are also saying, is big data sort of a big brother type of thing? How do we feel about this? Is this sort of robbing people of the ability to kind of live their lives in a relatively unobserved way, and instead we're constantly under a microscope? Um, so uh, maybe the biggest question, though, is, is all of this a fad? Or is there something about it that is, in fact, enduring? Is it going to be a real thing? Um, and by the, by the end of, you know, at least what I'm going to say, and hopefully by the end of this session today, we'll sort of have uh, more that we can add into that conversation. Um, lastly, I just want to say that the high-level impressionistic questions that I just went through about, you know, what is big data, these do translate into things like what you know. What are the the big dogs doing? What are the common mistakes uh, that that losers are making? Technologies. What are the ones that matter? Kinds of data. What's what's out there that people are using in new ways? Analytics. How are we bringing those new kinds of data together? Doing something useful with them. How quickly is all of this diffusing? Or can I wait? Is this going to be happening later? And I'll be fine if I ignore it now. Um, how much should I spend? How much should I budget? You know, if I'm not going to be left behind, what should our IT group and our business units that are going to be getting into this, roughly what, they should, what should they be spending in 2016? And how do we know if we're on the path to getting any value out of it? Um, these are really practical questions that people are asking, and of course, you're probably answering many of these for yourself um, and with your clients with your conclusion sheet. So I, I like this definition about big data. Um, it's data that's so big you can't really manage it. Uh, if, if you can handle it fairly easily, you're either really good and you know, maybe your data really is bigger than anybody else. Uh, but I think a hallmark of how all of this is unfolding is the opportunities to pull together different kinds of data and new sorts of analytics are rapidly outstripping all the infrastructure that we put together, even on a kind of, not just yearly, but quarter by quarter basis to manage all of this stuff. So this is something that will likely be true for a little while as we figure out what's the sort of sweet spot to putting together these larger sets uh, with, with all different varieties. And so if you, if you buy that, then maybe you'll buy this, that the idea that I've started in, in the talk of the title of the talk, that if you're going to make the most out of big data, what you want to do is make it small. Um, all right, that sounds so simple as to be almost motherhood and apple pie. How do we actually do that? Two things you don't want to do. Don't just leave it all with IT. Um, and I, I'm a recovering engineer. My first job out of university was doing optical character recognition for a uh, startup. And I still do a lot of programming. So no offense to my, my fellow nerds. I, I, do, I do appreciate and love IT. Uh, however, that function is there um, typically not to drive the business agenda of the users of technology but to consult and figure out what that's going to be and then build systems that will help meet whatever those needs are. Now, the, the more kind of evolved IT executive is a, is a, is a real thought partner and strategic partner and, and lines up and is kind of working very collaboratively with business units. The reality of a lot of IT organizations is that the, you know, the CIO, the senior staff, would love to be in that role but aren't often in that role. Um, so, it's a mistake to think IT will just hand me what I need. If you're not actively involved as a business leader in thinking about what, what is going on in your market, how, the, how the, the use of data will allow you to put together new business models and change how you're meeting your customers' whims, whatever they are, then you probably won't get where you want to go. So 
don't just leave it with IT. Uh, another thing that you don't want to do is just say, well, uh, I'm going to go with my gut. Uh, even if your gut is pretty extra large, this is, not, this is not the only answer that you want. I'm not saying don't use your intuition by any means. Uh, but if there's one thing that we learn in, in academics, and one thing that we get sort of beat into us, and at this point I've been thoroughly brainwashed, so um, you, sh you should know who you're hearing from. But you know, the idea that your intuition is always going to guide you is a mistake. Unless, unless you've got that sort of 10,000 hours of exposure to whatever it is, and you know so much that you don't even know what you know, then you don't want to be just making decisions based on your intuition. Um, and there are times, of course, when the world is changing and your 10,000 hours hasn't been repeated yet in the new world. And data at that point could sort of tell you, hey, that intuition that you built up was brilliant for the world that we're just now leaving behind. And the world that we're about to enter into is one where that doesn't work. And that's where you want not only to be using your intuition, your gut, but you also want to be using data. So don't just go with your gut. Don't ignore it, but don't just go to it. So, all right, big data's out there. Um, we don't want to leave it with IT. We don't just want to rely on our gut. So how can we sort of make it visual and make it small? Um, a perspective on all this, uh, which I can say quickly, is that data is like the sea. You can drown in it. And with data, and I'm sorry, I messed this headline up. You can see it in the, in the bottom here. But with data, beauty can be in the details. Um, but it is also sometimes the case that revolutions aren't exactly in the details. And we have to actually step back and look at the bigger picture to see what's amazing. Um, so whether what we're doing is looking at a big picture, which is a huge data set, or what we're doing is looking at configurations in smaller data sets. It's not actually the size of our data that matters, but it's the depth of the insight that we're getting from it. Um, and that's where analytics comes into play um, and where we don't want to just be bragging about how big the data are, but we want to be thinking about what we're able to do with it. Um, so People that are good at this follow classic disciplines of any kind of empirical analysis where you first describe what's in your data set. Think about the different kinds of distributions across the different measures that you have so that as you're trying to do something statistically, you don't use the wrong sort of estimation. Um, where you've got things that are, in fact, not continuous measures, make them categorical ones. So evaluate the, the, the different things that you have there and put, put things into the classes that they belong into. Then once you have that, you're able to start to test some hypotheses, do some explanation, even make some predictions, and start to make decisions based on what you're finding. Um, this is nothing new for researchers. We've been doing it for a while. These are kind of the sorts of uh, questions and perspectives that we teach uh, PhD students as they're learning how to work with data. Um, but you know, we're talking about the, using this not for research, but in business, and translations are required there. Um, so, whereas often, for example, a regression analysis is designed to kind of not be too pushed around by strange cases. In business, sometimes it's the strange case. If it's the harbinger of things that are about to come, that really matters. So we want to take note of those things. Um, trial and error, we want to be you know, doing things over again and thinking about how the conditions might be changing as opposed to trying to keep everything fixed as we would often do uh, in, in sort of a more scientific uh, mode. Uh, you want to think about making it pay. So if you're not actually seeing things that are tangible benefits, then um, you know, stop, change what you're doing. Um, and of course, funnel money to the things that are working. So this is a different way of thinking than the classic disciplines, but they, but they can be brought together. If you're good at all that, you have a problem, which is that often, as the person doing the analytics, people don't understand what you're on about. You're very excited. You've just run some machine learning. You've seen that there's a real pattern here. You've done some deep learning, perhaps. 
um, and you try to explain it to a business unit leader who maybe is in charge of a supply chain and you're saying, I see that we have the opportunity. This is, a, this is an interesting conversation in consumer packaged goods right now. I see that we have the opportunity to increase our margin on these brands by undoing 25 years of skew pr proliferation and brand extensions, which we did in an era where we thought that we needed to have you know, every kind of product under the sun to outcompete the, you know, the other brands. That's a big ask you know, for the business unit leader to say, OK, we're going to cut radically the number of SKUs that we have, and we're going to make more money. You need to be able to explain that in sufficient detail, not just that the, the, the decision maker understands what you're saying should be done, but that they understand why you're right. Um, and going into the depth and the detail of what you're doing is where you tend to get you know, blank stares. So what can we do to get value from big data, make it small and visual? Let me show you a couple of just small examples of making it visual. Um, so getting through remains like this is pretty overwhelming. But it turns out this data structure can be turned into something that looks like a tree. And so if we, if we do that, and we just look at the transformation of the whole maze into a tree, then we take our starting point, which is now this leftmost node, um, and we can start to walk through this much more easily than we had, oh, that's a dead end. much easier than what we had when we were back at the whole maze. So sometimes we want to visualize what we can do with data to show patterns and structure that exist that we'd have a hard time seeing if we weren't visualizing it. Other times, it's not about patterns, but it's about process that we want to visualize. So if you do a lot of coding, you might be able to look at this and know exactly what it does. But if you're not doing a lot of coding, you know, you don't want to say, well, I'm going to use Floyd's cycle finding algorithm to show where we've got kind of um, cycles that should be chains, which we can get rid of. OK, thanks, Killer, but I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Well, what could you do? You could say, this is essentially what we're doing. We take all of our graph data that shows kind of how transactions are happening. We set up two different rabbits in the maze. One goes twice as fast as the other. And when the two meet, we mark that point and we repeat from the beginning. And by doing that, we find where there are loops that we might want to undo. Let's say that was a problem that you were trying to solve. So rather than just leaving it with the code, we're increasingly learning how to teach people how to think about algorithms by visualizing how they work. So here the two are chasing. We mark that spot. We start from the beginning and from that spot. They meet again. And now we know where the cycle is. So sometimes what we want to do is visualize for patterns, as with the maze. Sometimes we want to visualize for process, because this helps us start to think about how algorithms work and how we can make them work better. This is taking what's going on and making it more accessible, um, which, when you've got something that's very complicated, allows you to start to make it small enough that people can understand it. Here's a similar sort of thing with a, an algorithm called merge sort. It's a simple sort of algorithm that you would, you would probably implement in a fairly early on computer science class. Um, what it's doing is it's taking a whole bunch of um, unordered quantities, and it's, ra and, it's, and it's gradually turning the whole thing into smoothly ranked um, by doing it kind of in neighborhoods that are increasing in size. So first, we're just comparing a pair, then we're comparing four, then we're comparing eight. And you can see what's starting to happen here is that we get larger neighborhoods within the whole array that are ranked. And this will go on several more times, but I'll spare us the exciting detail of this um, and just show what it looks like when we're done. Click, click, click. This would work. So when we're finished, oops, what we get is something like this. This is through all the iterations that we just went through. So sometimes we visualize 
to see patterns. Sometimes we visualize to see process. But increasingly, what we want to be able to do is visualize to see how we're interacting with the data in a way that's leading us to either new procedures or new decisions. OK, great. Thanks, Mark. But these are toy problems. We have real world problems. You know, what can we do about that? Um, Here's a couple of examples from work that is the kind of stuff that I do that I would call examples uh, that are analytics of disruption. So um, the first one is a case study of a category, a, a, a market that's called service design. And it's kind of a mashup of industrial engineering and thinking about how to do the, the service aspects of, of businesses that um, are not about artifacts, but are about customer experiences. So it would be the sort of thing where you design, for example, the customer experience of, of buying and owning a supercar. That's one of the products that, uh, one of the projects that um, the firm that my student, Eva Kirchberger, has been working with. It's one of their projects. Um, so this is a, uh, a look at this service design category and how it's changed over time by looking at the features of the category. So creative, innovative, client capabilities, brand, strategy, satisfaction, process, loyalty, journey, interaction, insights, experience, et cetera. This is called a chord diagram. And each arc on the circumference is, the, is sort of the relative importance of that particular feature in what people are thinking about based on how these things are co-mentioned together. So the more people are talking about things together, the more central they are to the concept. So this, in a way, gives us a picture of the concept for service design circa 1997. And we can rank all of the ideas here, just top to bottom, and see kind of what the relative importance is uh, with a simplified ranking. 2013, we can have a look at that, and we see that it's different. Um, so this is kind of what you do. You look at, see how these things change over time. And just to boil that all down, one of the things that's really interesting here is in the early days of this market, people talked a lot about process, not so much about strategy. Why has that changed? It's changed because now organizations like IBM are hiring designers at the yin yang and saying, uh, we, we need to get more of this. Tata Consulting have 3,000 people that are doing what they call service design. I guarantee most of them did not go to an industrial design program. And most of them don't look like designers who dress not like me, which is boring, but you know have like really interesting kind of weird clothes and different colored hair and piercings and tattoos and stuff like that. Um, it's a completely different kind of vibe. So basically, the Dalio entrants, people who are coming in from existing businesses are shifting this to make it look more boring, to make it look more businesslike. And the people that were more artistic about it, they're kind of like facing a very, for them, frustrating experience, like, you know, fighting the Borg from that Star Trek, you know, stuff. Resistance is futile. They just cannot man up against the strength of all of these new entrants. So very useful to know that the area that you're in is being disrupted. Smart buildings, here's an example of that happening to a very large firm. Um, in 1998, they were A. They were still A in 2013, but their proportion kind of of the relative significance of this market uh, around something that you might think of as smart buildings shrunk radically. The idea of facility management, which they were known for and dominated in that time period, much less significant in 2013. So again, uh, being being disrupted by new entrants, uh, new entrants having a, a greater capacity to do data. And uh, they're, they're not very happy about all that. So I don't know that much about FinTech. That's not my space. I sort of more study things that are, you know, I'm not, I'm not known for service design or FinTech, or I have done more work on ad tech lately. But again, what I'm interested in is just how all of these things get disrupted. This is a map of what's going on in ad tech. And these innovations have been going on since the late 90s, picking up steam in about 2003, 2004, with loads of venture money going into this. And to this day, this space is extraordinarily confusing. It's a very complex landscape. And even the kinds of organizations that are competing against each other is still in a lot of flux. So what we have here is, for example, um, 
ad exchanges, DSP, media buying firms, agencies, um, data optimizers, uh, DMPs and data aggregators, literally every year there's almost a new label saying here's a different kind of firm. And almost certainly not all the kinds of firms are going to last, let alone not all the firms of a particular kind. So it's a very confusing uh, landscape. This is classically what we talk about as kind of disruption where there's a lot of change. It's not clear how that's going to work out. Um, I think the same kind of thing is probably coming out of fintech right now, but it's earlier in the development of fintech than that whole ad tech world. If what happened in ad tech happens in fintech, it's not going to be over in a year or two. It's going to take a little while for that to unfold, and there will be a uh, kind of a flux that goes on for quite a while. So questions you can ask to think about how to deal with that. Um, what are the key data, the, the things that we might want in volume at a certain velocity and of a kind of variety? Not just banks or people that are in financial services now, but who else have those key data? Um, digital marketers and raters, banks and modal, mobile networks, people that are makers of mobile apps, employment, uh, electronic health record, um, your car, other devices that talk to each other, things in your home. What complementarities lead to new opportunities? Where might there be chances for growth through cross-selling? Uh, better margins through increased efficiency. Uh, better margins through better risk assessment. Um, and then what are the key threats? You know, where might there be sort of non-bank banking, non-financial services, financial services, uh, because of the, the nexus of all these things coming together? I put those things out there, and now let me end on the metaphor that I talked about. When people are facing disruption, you know, it's easy to say, I don't need to worry about that um, because I'm too big to fail. And so here's, here's a kind of metaphor for that. Cruise ships are big. The interiors are spacious and, and, and beautiful. Um, and sometimes extremely luxurious. So why would you ever want to get off of these things um, and get into a boat like one of those? Well, it's not for the comfort and the luxury of it, clearly. You know, these boats are not so spacious, not so luxurious. And you know, um, fortunately, when I fly back to London tonight, I'm going to be in the premium economy section, so I won't be dealing quite with coach. But coach is luxurious compared to this. 150 people packed in like sardines in a can. Um, so you just thought airline economy seating was bad. And you know, if getting onto a flight starts to make you feel claustrophobic, think about the process of getting into one of these lifeboats. This is from a Viking uh, sort of safety card, Viking cruise lines. The, the plan, you might not want to. You might not want to know all of this before you go on your cruise, is that they drop the boats into the water and they make one of these things. And I don't know if you can see this, but you're, you're diving into something that's not as big as you are, that you're going to make it bigger as your weight slides down. So if you're claustrophobic, this is not what you want. Um, and yet, there are definitely times, even if you are on a pretty big boat, when, and you know how the story is going to go, this is a boat which is called the Wahini, and on April 10th in 1968, this inter-island ferry between the North and South Island, the South coming actually from South to North on that particular journey, um, encountered some very rough seas. When you're on a very big boat, there are times when you want to get into a small one instead, if that is you act before it is too late. Because acting before it's too late can make all the difference. Here is a lifeboat. Not as nice as those enclosed ones that we just looked at that did make it safely to shore. Um, the Wahini went down within sight of the shore. Why? Well, the captain was actually a good sailor. Uh, it was a seaworthy vessel. But the weather that was chasing them, which was a ferocious storm, came upon them faster than anybody predicted. And that's exactly what we're trying to figure out how to avoid in business. When if there's a coming storm that people are saying, it's going to hit you, it's going to hit you, it's going to hit you, when can you say, no, I'm pretty sure you're right. It's going to turn a different direction and I'm going to be fine versus when is it going to actually come on you faster than you ever could have thought and you end up having something like this.
Um, I'm not suggesting that big banks are all of a sudden going to fail. I think, uh, as Torsten and I were talking earlier, I think 80% of the big banks today that we have are going to be big banks tomorrow. They might be smaller, but they'll still be around. So there are going to be some firms that are at stake, but certainly there are going to be lots of careers that are at stake. And so what you want to do is think about the applications of data and analytics that are likely to incite controversies and taint reputation, then stay away from those. You want to think about applications that are going to attract lots of money and hype, and then they're only going to fizzle. And don't get so deep into those that you can't unwind without you know, being able to have an acceptable write-down. Then you want to also think about which applications are going to create superior platforms for familiar tasks. You, know, you can't see all this with a crystal ball, but you can try, you can experiment along the way, and you can go deeper when things start to take off. And then you also, of course, want to think about when there are applications that are going to spawn new markets and confer an advantage. And you want to be on the green ones and out of the red ones here, these two questions. But these are big picture questions that are going to have stakes for careers and even firms that, that I would leave with you. So this idea about is this big data thing a fad or is it the real deal, it's a bit of both, to be honest. There's a lot of people that are uber excited about things that are definitely not going to go the way they are predicting. But there's just no question but that there is a storm coming. And it's going to catch a lot of people who are left surprised, thinking they're going to be able to outrun it or it's never going to come. When it does hit, you want to be ready. Uh, and to do that, I suggest that when it comes to big data, you do this idea of getting value out of it by making it small and visual. And I can boil all that down to two words, which is, Demand demystification. Don't allow people to come to you and say stuff that's very complicated, which makes them sound smart and you feel stupid. Um, instead, demand that it be turned into language that your, your grandparent could understand, even though they don't know anything about all of this, because then you're going to be able to make decisions with your brain, which isn't changing size with data. That's it for me. Thanks, James. Back to you.